Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the SEEP Network, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar, Information Technology Management and Strategy, Creating Efficiency and Controlling Costs in Your Parish. On behalf of the SEEP Network, my name is Zach Beal. I'm Director of Operations and Strategic Partnerships for St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Kansas City, Missouri. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Tom is Vice President of Business Development for Moonshot Innovations. Earl Spurgeon is Director of Cloud Services. And Joshua Woods is Senior Identity Architect. All of these gentlemen are from Moonshot Innovations. And when I had my first conversation with them about IT, I saw an opportunity to share their, um, their great information that they had to share and the great news that they had to share with us uh, with the SEEP Network. Uh, this webinar and our other webinars will be available after uh, the recording goes up on the website at seepnetwork.org. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom to, uh, to lead us out, and thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Zach. Um, as he said, my name is Tom Frakasha with Moonshot Innovations. I'd like to um, thank you for the opportunity to meet with each one, uh, with everyone today. Um, we hope each of you walk away with two to three solid points that you can explore uh, to improve the efficiency of your own technical environment and, uh, and workflows as well. Moonshot Innovations is a technical services firm here in Kansas City that offers small and medium-sized businesses across the, com uh, the country technical and strategic uh, help with their IT needs. The best part um, is, well, educating clients and showing how to save money through proper configuration and the reduction of third-party products uh, that can do the same thing. Then watching, uh, watching them save the money and, um, and reallocate it to other needs within their organizations, um, or maybe just you know, keeping, not spending the money at all. So we know, we all know that that's important these days. So um, with that, again, I'd like to thank you all. Um, I'll turn it over to Earl and Josh and uh, let them uh, begin the presentation here though. Thank you. Uh, yes, so this is Earl Spurgeon. Uh, we started the discussion with Zachary uh, with a quick review of literally licenses that he had and what was included in there um, as part of the uh, suite of, of products he got. Those suites change literally month to month, quarter to quarter as we move forward. And that's the part that's really hard for organizations to keep track of is, is what's changing, what's new, what's included now, what wasn't included. And as we went through there, we started identifying uh, areas where he could save money by not buying other applications or, uh, in, in, in his case, some hardware that could possibly be phased out as we move more to some of the cloud services. And so we're going to kind of repeat that conversation just a bit uh, more generic this morning of what kind of things are in some of these suites of products and where possibly uh, there are some duplications. Um, so Josh, I'm gonna turn this over to you. I think you've got, got a PowerPoint that we're gonna start presenting and we're gonna start walking through some of the suites of things that uh, particularly some of the Microsoft suite that I think pretty much all of you probably already own today. Uh, so we're, we'll start there and see where the discussion goes to. Josh? Um, before I share this slide deck out, you know, just to tack on to what Tom and Earl had said, you know, when we, when we had met with Zach uh, a couple weeks ago to discuss some things that had gone on in their network, um, I'm not only the identity architect, but I'm the security architect as well over at Moonshot. And uh, one of the things that the Microsoft suite does very well now that you guys have access to is the security portion of it. Um, and one of the things that Zach just experienced uh, in their network uh, here in Kansas City, we could have, um, you know, helped the situation that they had with the attack that they experienced with the recovery that they had to go through um, with some of these tools that, that Microsoft offers from the, the M365 stack, O365 stack, we could have made it a little easier um, to recover from for them, for the things that they went through, but also even before that, to help prevent what they went through um, and keep monitoring over that entire suite um, to let everybody know what's going on, uh, what's, what's going on in the environment, keep tabs on everything as we see it come through, and, and honestly help prevent those from uh, occurring in that environment. Uh, so let me figure out here on Zoom how to actually uh, share this. Give me one sec.
Can everyone see my screen right now? Yeah, it looks yeah. good, Josh. Okay, looks good. So we wanted to go through, and, and Tom, I'll let you go through these first couple slides, and then Earl and I will, will pick, uh, pick up after you're done. Okay, so really the core of what we do, um, we try to remind ourselves every single day, technology should create efficiencies, control cost, and protect assets. Always, always, always. Uh, absolutely critical in everything that we do here. I don't know if you want to uh, advance that. There you go. Okay. Um, and, and the only thing I'll add to that before handing it back over is that, um, you know, in our minds, it should always start with the business goals or the goals of your organization. And we build technology around that. Technology, technology should not um, drive the, the business decisions, but those business decisions and those business goals should drive the technology that you utilize so that you can properly configure that. Okay. In this, we're, we're going to go through some of the, you know, comparing of what you guys have used in your environment, what you're currently using, what that functionality does for you, what the M365 stack can do in replacement or, or in place of some of those third-party apps and, and lead back to what Tom had talked about earlier, really saving you uh, the cost of that overlapping functionality or, or the overlapping technologies that you guys have in the environment. And it's all about right-sizing. When you, when you think about the tools that you use, the licensing that you have, the, the technology that you pay for, um, you want to get that right size because what we find in a lot of different environments is that people are paying for three and four products that all do about the same thing. So you're really tripling and quadrupling your costs of something that, that can be done with one tool, one suite. Um, so getting that all down to that one cost, that one bundle um, really uh, benefits your organization, really helps your organization keep those costs down and, and be produ as productive as possible. With the workflow efficiencies, you know, there are certain tool sets and you guys I'm sure have experienced this in your environment to where you try and grab three and four different products to make your your collaboration tools work the way that you guys need them to in your environment the way you guys do your business the way you collaborate the way you share um, you know uh, files, share information, uh, even just communications. Uh, there's, you know, like we're, we're on Zoom right now. You guys may use uh, Zoom as well as, as multiple other video communications tools. And even in our environment, even though we're a Microsoft shop, we have to communicate outside of, of Teams and outside of the Microsoft stack using Zoom to communicate with some of our clients. But there is a way to combine that all from the Microsoft stack and they've made it, like Earl said earlier, you know, month to month, quarter to quarter, it's changing rapidly. And Microsoft is bringing that into where those Zoom calls, those other third party uh, communication apps are going to be able to, to join into the Teams network to where you could have just that one tool communicate with all your clients from that one tool. So as we get into the... Uh, M365 suite itself, which when you think about M365, you need to think about the three different pieces of that suite. And those three different pieces are Office 365, which is O365, um, Enterprise Mobility and Security, which is EMS, and Windows itself. The M365 suite now encompasses all three of those products, and they have different licensing packages, bundles, that include all of these features inside of those bundles to help benefit your organization as a whole with all the different products from security, identity, operating systems, all those different features wrapped into that one bundle cost to keep it as low as possible and keep you guys as functional as possible. Hey, Zach, um, I'm sorry, Josh, could I make a, a point here while you're, before yep. you get into the 365? I think it's important to note that as we talk to many of our clients, um, we find very quickly that 
um, it's unfortunate, even though they may have a, a good license package, they're really only utilizing maybe 20 or 30 percent of the functionality within that license. And so those items that Josh just summarized right there um, often go unused and people are paying extra money for the third party applications that perform the same same task. So I just wanted to add that in there. Um, proper configuration is everything. And I'll let you get back into that. Thank you, Josh. So. Starting with the O365 portion of it, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to keep referencing back to what Zach and, and his uh, office went through, the, the data loss prevention and, and the advanced threat protection portion of, of O365 is really where the bread and butter is of the O365 suite. Um, the data loss prevention is basically, it looks over what data is flowing in and out of Exchange directly. And not only Exchange, but SharePoint, OneDrive, all the different products that Microsoft has. And we can put classifications around it. We can, it, it monitors it always. We always get alerts, notifications. If anything is out of the ordinary, if specified data such as banking account numbers, social security numbers, things of that nature are flagged as being shared improperly or out of the norm, we will be notified and we can have automatic uh, uh, actions taken on that data as it's, it's being shared out. Either, and not only as we share it externally, but things coming into us can be flagged as well to say, hey, this is coming in. We need to make sure you know about it. Um, was it uh, supposed to be sent in? Do we need to protect it? Do we need to put it in a certain area um, to keep it secure? So data loss prevention is a huge monitoring and security tool from that O365 stack. Then the advanced threat protection is a bundle of tools. When you think about security as a whole, this bundle of tools in the advanced threat protection suite includes tools for uh, blocking against phishing, which I know Zach has told us you guys deal with on a regular basis, especially, especially for um, the heads of the organization um, and how they get spoofed a lot, how uh, a lot of phishing attacks come in with their names, you know, maybe, maybe uh, modified just a little bit to make it look like it's coming from that specific user um, and have you guys fall for those attacks easier. Um, so the phishing, then the anti-malware, anti-spam, um, there's that suite is what includes all those tools and they're highly configurable. And what Microsoft has done is Microsoft has gone out and purchased all these different uh, technology pieces from companies around the, the country, around the world to bring into their stack to make it on par with the best out there. If you look at some of the Gartner statistics, Microsoft is right there in the top three in the world with their protection suite that they have. And one of the things that Microsoft benefits from is when you think about your environment and you think about O365, it is based out there in the cloud. Now, what happens is when you send when you get an email sent into you before that email ever hits your O365 tenant, Microsoft will take that email and it will put it in a bubble out in the cloud and it will open that, that email and any attachments or anything inside that email, any links inside those emails and detonate them up there in the cloud. If there's any malicious software, if the emails don't match up, anything like that, it will not deliver it into the tenant. So that attack never makes it inside your organization, whether it be a phishing attack, whether it be a, a malware inside of attachment, whether it be a, a, a link, uh, an unsafe link, it will not allow that link to ever be accessed from within your tenant. So this set of tools is what really uh, keeps that security around your entire tenant, um, keeping your users, keeping your data secure at all times and keeping watch over everything. So those tools from the O365 portion are really what, what help secure that data. Now, once you get into the EMS suite, 
this is when you really start to secure your user identities and your devices. The uh, Enterprise Mobility and Security Suite um, includes tools such as the multi-factor authentication uh, MFA, which is the dual factor authentication, um, which is where when you sign in, you, you can either have it set up to be prompted for a pin code, it'll make, make a, a call or a text ring out to the user's phone or application on their phone um, to, to force that second factor of authentication. So we're not just having that single layer, we have an added layer of protection on every sign-in. Um, and that can be customizable as well, but that what that prevents is if somebody's credentials get stolen, not only do they have to have that user's password, but they also have to have that second layer of protection, which is either that application, uh, that phone number, or like Zach had asked for, we can enable Windows Hello in your environment to where you have to have either the biometric facial scan, uh, fingerprint scan, um, you know, just adding that, that second layer that only you yourself can provide. Uh, there, they have done multiple studies around the environment to try and beat that second factor. Can it be beaten? Of course, but it takes a serious amount of time and effort to beat that. And, and most, most attacks will give up as soon as they see that second factor is involved. Um, then we get into the Intune and Autopilot section of it, which deals with the devices that you use. Intune is basically your device management software. And we can apply security policies, update policies, uh, you know, any application packages, any of that to all the devices that reside in your environment. And what this helps do is keep control and keep watch over the functionality and the health of the devices that your people are using. And not only can we, we wrap the policies and security around those devices that uh, your organization owns directly, but also around any device that your people log into outside of an organization or a corporate owned device. Um, so anytime that user logs into a personal device or a, um, you know, say they were at a, a hotel and they needed to borrow a computer, um, you know, the user logs in and they have to have the second factor of authentication. And then in order for them to access any of the uh, uh, information inside of your tenant, it has to abide by any of those Intune policies, which are called uh, mobile application management policies. Um, and if those machines don't abide by it, if they're vulnerable to attacks or their security isn't up to what we specify in the environment, we can not allow, we can prevent access from occurring from that device as well. Um, and that's, that's really getting into the granular level of it, but I just wanna let you guys know what is capable from this product. Um, the autopilot feature, uh, again, this is one that Zach could have benefited from uh, greatly uh, with the attack that they had go on. But what autopilot does is autopilot takes the information of all your devices from a, uh, hardware or motherboard issue, if you will, all the unique identifiers of that device and places them out in the cloud in your tenant to where anytime that device comes online, we can pass information to that device, whether it be a build from out of the box or a security uh, standpoint to where we could have in Zach's case, stopped that machine from ever accessing our tenant, fired off a rebuild on it because we knew the, the information was unsecure, we knew that device was unsecure, and have that machine back up and running within 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the connection strength that that device had at the time. So none of the people, and again, these can be accessed from anywhere in the world. As long as there's an internet connection, they can communicate with the Microsoft Cloud and we can handle all of this functionality from anywhere in the world. Um, the 
so in, in Zach's case, with everybody having to come into the office and re-image those machines and, and spend the time doing all that, he could have clicked a button from the portal and had all of those machines uh, re-imaged within you know, 15 to 30 minutes. I'm gonna jump in here, um, Josh. Uh, just to give a little bit of context here, uh, they've referenced a few times what happened at St. Andrews. St. Andrews was a victim of a ransomware attack a couple weeks ago. And uh, we had been in the process of, of uh, transferring some of our services over to uh, the Microsoft platform. Uh, all of, almost all of our staff computers are already running Windows. We have Microsoft Business Platform. Um, but we were doing, we have an on-premises server and we had uh, a separate company doing uh, our security. The uh, ransomware attack didn't come from a phishing email necessarily. It was actually uh, the uh, defense platform that the company that we had contracted through, um, that was actually the weak, li weak link that brought that uh, attack into our computers. All of our computers were um, encrypted and it took the better part of a week to get us back online. I think what uh, Moonshot is kind of highlighting here is the fact that uh, had we implemented some of the tools that we already paid for, uh, that process could have been much, much quicker. So I see some, uh, some interest in the, um, in the chat box about uh, why this is platform specific. The reason this is platform specific right now is we're discussing what tools you might already have at your disposal in order to resolve some issues that may come up. Um, and based on uh, conversations with other SEEP administrators, I know that most of us are probably using the Microsoft platform and yet probably not using that to its full uh, capability. So just uh, please feel free to post your thoughts and questions and I'll continue to, um, uh, to read through the chat and, and, and highlight as we go on uh, what's, uh, what the relevance to uh, our parishes is. Thank you so much. And just to, to give a little side note here, Google also has a package that, that in their yeah. Google suite and has a lot of these similar features. They are a bit different, but it goes to show whichever path you chose, whether it be Microsoft or Google, you do need to investigate that, that suite, see what's in it before you make a lot of decisions on adding other products. Correct. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, it, it's not a marketing or anything like that. I, I am a Microsoft specialist. I, I have been in the Microsoft world for 20 plus years, um, and this is my specialty. We, we come in and help people who have, you know, the, the G Suite products and some other products that want to, you, you know, most of the time they're running both Microsoft and G Suite, um, and, and they want to get the best of the technology that they're using. So I'm just trying to go over um, from a, an overview standpoint, what the Microsoft stack offers, what you guys can benefit from that you're, you're already utilizing a lot of these products, um, but may not have some of the features turned on or may not have some of those features in place to help protect you or help benefit you guys uh, in, in the way that your organization runs. Uh, so uh, please, yeah, if there are questions and Zach, you can stop me at any time if there's questions that, that come up that we need to address, but really it, it's all about utilizing the things that you guys already have or may benefit from that you don't know about, um, which is why we're going through this right now. Yeah, and, I, and I, just to highlight that or uh, drill that down a little deeper, I think uh, based on these sort of compartments that Josh is, or these buckets that Josh is lining out, any solution that uh, the church is using probably has the pieces of this puzzle. So you can look at this also through a generic lens and understand that uh, you need to be thinking about security. You need to be thinking about device authentication. You need to be thinking about data loss and prevention and backups and things like that. And, it, and if you're a Microsoft user, probably the Microsoft platform has something for you. If you're a Google user, all the better, uh, Google has a platform for that as well. But these are the buckets that we as church administrators probably need to be considering. Correct, thank you, Zach. So back through the list, the uh, SSO portion is, is what's called single sign-on. And what single sign-on gives us the capability to do is reduce the amount of identities that we have. Like you guys may have an identity for office, 
an identity for Google, an identity for Zoom, an identity for all these third party products, you know, a login for each of those. What SSO co covers and helps with is we try and get that down to as few identities as possible. And the way that works is Azure Active Directory is the backplane basically that holds all of your identity. And we can add these third party products their application into Azure Active Directory to tie into there to where your O365 credential can be used across all those different applications. So you have that one identity that's secured by Azure Active Directory and recognized by all these third-party apps in conjunction with Azure to where it creates that that holistic secure view to where you have one identity and that one identity is the only threat plane that you have to reduce that threat across all those applications. And you can tie the multi-factor against it. You can tie all of the uh, policies around that identity. Um, depending on the third party app, there are some that won't allow certain things such as multi-factor, but for the most part, all these third party providers are allowing Azure Active Directory into their uh, login environment and allowing that security because it is such a secure way of doing business. Um, so that's single sign-on. As we get into this last bullet point, the Azure Information and Identity Protection, um, this is something where Microsoft really there hasn't been a great competitor out there that I can compare this, this uh, information and identity protection to uh, as a whole. But what this basically does, AIP, is it puts a layer of security at the metadata level, which is the lowest granular level of any file or your identity directly, and ties that security to either that document or data whether it be in your organization, whether it flows outside of it um, and your identity as well, wherever you use it, it's at that metadata level of each of those that this security resides and it cannot be modified. There is no way to modify that metadata, metadata layer. So when you enable the information protection piece of it on the data that you guys use, it basically, holds a policy or a label from your tenant to say that we are not going to allow this data to be accessed anywhere unless you check in with Azure or O365 and make sure that you are, for one, allowed to see this data, and for two, that this data is still viable because we can put timeframes on it, we can put uh, uh, classifications to where it will only be available uh, to certain companies or certain organizations. If they're outside of that, it will not be accessible, period. Every time this data is opened, it has to check in with Azure before it's allowed access into it. So we, we have implemented this for multiple uh, companies around the Kansas City area, around the U.S., um, and it has greatly benefited people from that data loss. Uh, you know, we, we talked about DLP earlier in the O365 portion of it. I mean, that's one layer of it, but but that's an uh, like a, a overview uh, or, or, you know, an overreaching protection over the organization as a, ho a whole and just looking over it. The AIP piece of it actually digs into that data at that data level and protects it from that data level. So it's the most granular protection you can get, the highest security you can get. Um, and, and honestly, it's the way everybody is going to move towards in the future with the, the attacks that are coming in, with the, the things that we're seeing. Without that protection on that data, you're really never going to be as secure as possible. You're always going to be open to attacks. You're always going to have... And, and, these attacks are getting more and more sophisticated as time goes on. I mean, we're all seeing it. It's the trend. It's the way of the world. Um, and and it, it's just what we're going to have to start thinking about is it, protecting it at that data layer. The identity protection piece of it, what, what it does is it's basically a monitoring and reaction tool to your O365 uh, identity. And 
it plays in with SSO and MFA uh, as well from a, the, the standpoint of it watches over to make sure that when your identity logs in, it's logging in from locations that we've allowed, it's logging in with the factors that we asked or you know put in place to allow login, and then it's verifying that it's either uh, able to access or it's going to block it. And every time that we get a blocked access or an abnormal login or anything is seen, your administrators will be notified immediately to tell you, listen, something's going on with this identity. You can even put in place uh, automatic enforcements to where if it sees abnormal activity, it will lock that account down until mitigations are taken to protect that identity, whether that be a passive reset, whether that be an investigation into what's going on if those you know credentials were actually stolen and something deeper needs to happen. Um, but it, it's just that extra layer of security added into the identity uh, portion of it. The Windows portion of it, everybody knows Windows is, is everybody's base plane. I don't know how many Mac users you guys have out there in the environment, but I'm pretty sure it's mostly mostly Windows, right, Zach? That's right. We, there are some churches that probably have more Macs than uh, St. Andrews does, but uh, we have one or two in our environment. Correct. Okay. So everybody knows Microsoft puts out security updates for Windows on a monthly basis. So what we can do from an M365 standpoint is control those updates and and have monitoring and uh, policies in place around those updates to make sure every device out there is has every security update that it needs to, so it's the most secure at all times. And again, the monitoring you know portion of it alerts all the admins who are watching over it to let them know, listen, this device is fully secure or this device over here had an issue applying its its updates or it's it's out of compliance and we need to to get some some eyes on it make sure it's secure because otherwise it could be vulnerable to an attack uh, then the other portion of it the bigger portion of it i know a lot of you guys are using um, third-party antivirus through webroot i believe zach um, and kaseya so That's right. um what Windows offers in some of these bundles to compare to that is uh, Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection. And it's just like any of those antivirus products out there. But again, um, you know, it, it's, it's come a long way. A couple years ago, I couldn't you know, say it was as strong as it, it is now, but with what Microsoft did over the last couple years and the development they put into it, uh, it, it is right up there again in the top three antivirus uh, softwares out there. Webroot is is really good as well. Um, you know, and there's there's multiple others that are are great at what they do as well. But with the bundle that you guys use and, and the you know the the products that you use, O365, if you move to the M365 and bundle it all together, it gives that smaller plane, that single plane view to look at. And advanced threat protection is is just as customizable, but it works well with all the different products, you know, in sync. Um, Intune can report on it. Intune can pass policies to it. Uh, the advanced threat protection from the O365 portal can link into it. So it's all about linking and creating that holistic security view for your environment. Um, it's much harder when you have the third party products all trying to work together and get them all in a single view. Um, so really that's what Microsoft has tried to do is get you that single tool to organize everything within your environment and help it be much more manageable from that single plane. Uh, if we move on to the next slide. Um, and, and while you're changing slides, we do have a question in the, uh, in the chat box related to um, a church that is on the Office 365 platform, but it looking for IT support for their entire system. And they'd uh, like some tips on that. So I do, I'm not sure at what point um, we can drill into that, but I wanted to uh, plant the seed now. And uh, Mary, we appreciate your question. I would just say one thing that consider in this is we, we have outsourced IT at St. Andrews and um, some of the reporting functions that Josh is sharing on that last slide would have been very helpful for us to detect that threat earlier. So. 
uh, even if we're outsourcing IT, we as administrators, it's helpful for us to have one platform to kind of look at and say, okay, how is the system going? Uh, how are things going in the system and take a pulse check for the organization? So um, I'll just uh, plant the seed for that question for later discussion. Correct. And, and I'll move through this last slide pretty quick, but this is the last one I have to go through. And then we can get into those questions and address those uh, as soon as I flow through this. So from uh, the Microsoft standpoint, I'm sure you all know, you know, it includes SharePoint teams and OneDrive within this stack. And those are your collaboration tools, whether it be internal, external, voice or video communication, telephone, um, you know, people use uh, SharePoint as their knowledge base in a lot of organizations. So really it's your collaboration tools, um, sharing your, your files across, you know, not only internal, but external uh, uh, partners as well. And, it's the, the plane at which we help keep everything secure. You know, all these tools flow into all of these products. So all the, the advanced threat protection, all the information protection, all those different tools are able to reach out to every one of these products and keep them all secure. So again, it flows back to that single plane, that single, you know, uh, bundle of tools to where it's much easier to manage it from that IT perspective. Um, and from an automation standpoint, I don't know how much you guys use, you know, we, we've only begun to, to have our discussions with Zach from this standpoint, but there's ways to use Teams and SharePoint to create these customizable workflows and business processes within your organization to make, um, things such as, you know, new, uh, new partners or new people coming into the organization when they have to have an account set up or when they have to have a new, um, you know, uh, account built throughout the system. There's ways we can automate that process from within SharePoint teams to make it where you enter just a bit of information and it'll populate it to wherever it needs to go. So just to give you an idea, you know, a quick hitter idea of what's possible with the customization. Um, and, and we we have some specialists inside our office. There are outside companies that can help you guys get dig further into that development. But we have a pretty strong uh, group inside that that can get it like from the Power BI perspective, Tom, and I know you can speak to that a lot more, Earl, you can speak to that a lot more um, as there is so much customization that can be done um, with those dashboards as Zach uh, led into from even just an I IT perspective of building these dashboards to give you guys that insight to what's going on in your environment to make you aware at all times at a, at the click of a button um, you can set up these screens and these dashboards to to get you that information and you can easily broadcast that information out to to all those that need access to it um, so that that's really everything that i had to go over from from my standpoint earl tom is there anything else you guys would like to to add before we get into to the some of the questions I think you did a, a great job covering all of this. Um, as I put in the comments, you know, the things that Josh just described, these are the most common overlap items that we experience with um, a lot of the organizations that we talk with. Josh, a question I've got for you, um, really, I guess, relative to the last slide, what are probably the top two items that you see the most redundancy in? For example, what are the organizations that you work with, what are the two items that um, those organizations most often pay extra for when they already have that in the bundle that they have, whether that's Microsoft or Google? I would say two of the biggest things that, that people pay extra for is a, for one, a file storage system. Zach, I know you guys personally, you know, use a server on site to house all your, your uh, file shares. Um, OneDrive and SharePoint can house all those at the cost that you, you guys are already paying in your licensing. And you're at the, one of the lowest tiers you can get, Zach, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, right? That's right. That's right. So, um, and G Suite offers the, you know, some of the same things with Google Drive. Um, but from a Microsoft standpoint, it's, it's SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, the other thing is telephony. Um, 
people have really jumped on the team's telephony uh, system because of number one, the ease of use and the cost. The cost from what we have seen is in most cases less than half of what people are paying for. Um, so it's a really huge beneficial tool and, and again, ease of use when you have the everything built into this Teams platform and that Microsoft has really made it uh, an easy tool to use. Granted, over the last few weeks, Microsoft has had a lot of issues uh, going on that everybody's seen, I'm, I'm sure, and everybody's aware of. But for the most part, it's been a solid system. Um, and up to that point three weeks ago, we had really only in our environment, we use it and have used it for the past two and a half years um, within Moonshot directly. We had one issue, one day where we had some, some issues with teams over that two and a half years. Um, but you know, with everything that's going on in the world right now with the pandemic, with everybody working from home, we can't expect Microsoft to be able to keep up you know, every day, day in, day out, and not have any issues. There's going to be some issues. And with every tool, everybody's going to experience those issues. But the Teams system as a whole has been extremely solid, um, you know, year over year. Um, as well, you know, Google, uh, Zoom, Ring, all those guys have been solid as well. So, but everybody has their issues. So it's really, those are the top two, Tom, the, the file sharing, okay. file storage, and the, the telephony system. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, I'll uh, I'll take the first shot at um, at addressing Marie's question here, um, and then Josh Earl, I'll let you follow up and fill in any gaps that I may have missed. But her question was really about IT support, looking at potential partners in the future, and um, you know what we've found is that often um, it can be challenging to find organizations that have depth in these spaces, whether it be the G Suite side or the Microsoft side. Our expertise happens to be Microsoft, but if you're on G Suite and you're talking with someone, first of all, I would suggest going to a trusted partner, somebody that you know, um, and then just visiting with them and finding how deep that conversation can go, right? Um, often the organizations that have the depth and the expertise um, really cater to the larger enterprise level organizations. So, um, you know, find a group that has that depth that can offer you the, um, the, the education and that has the depth in these uh, these technologies and and work out from there, but um, but that that can be a challenge. You're going to have to talk to some people. Start with the people that you know. Start with the organizations that you trust and build out from that. And I might Josh? even add I might even add on to that a little bit um, from uh, from the administrator's standpoint. I think one of the most important things that I've realized. Um, because we've interviewed probably 20 of these companies over the last um, six months, say, uh, is knowing specifically what your system is, what, what computers are on your system, how old are they, what software packages are you mm -hmm. using, and then um, having that information at your disposal when you interview these companies. On the interview side, uh, there are a lot of uh, companies that focus, like Tom mentioned, at different size uh, organizations. It sounds like yours is a pretty small organization. There are um, IT companies that focus on small and medium-sized businesses. We have uh, also TechSoup at our disposal um, where you can get some of these softwares, but they also offer uh, some of the support practices as well. The key, the key with um, taking a remote support thing is uh, how often does your church need someone to come on premises and fix something physical? And that's really been a decisive uh, moment for us. We have to have a company that can send somebody to have boots on the ground if a, if a system goes down. And that's not necessarily available from some of these other companies. That And that's what I was going to get into, Zach, was from that IT perspective, it really depends on your organization and how you guys are running. So if in Zach's case, he's got a lot of on-premise infrastructure and not so much cloud infrastructure. If you guys were to be in the M365 stack and be on Intune or Autopilot and OneDrive, you know, and not have that on-premise stance, there's no real reason that you would need to have an IT organization that, that has to come on site for any reason. Um, a lot of what we cover and the people that we cover from an IT perspective, we, we 
tend to stay away from the on-premise because we can't have our people going out to all these organizations at a moment's notice. We just don't have that amount of staff. We're, we're just a smaller uh, smaller company that deals with the small and medium-sized business. Um, so what we do is we help people move to these technologies. And if they do move to that cloud stance, that cloud structure, then we have the ability to support them. And in your case, Zach, where you had those devices that went down, um, what we do is we keep a, a, a machine on site in case there is a hardware issue that that machine can't just be have a rebuild fired off on it. We have that mover uh, user move to that spare machine that's on site, send us that broken one, we repair it, send it back out so that you always have that backup machine on. So again, it just flows into how each office is set up and how each each tenant runs, whether you have that on-premise or that cloud. Um, so it, it's really, it, it all needs to be customized to how you guys, what your stance is. And that's what I do is, is I come in and give you guys that advice, you know, that I'm, I'm the architect. I say, you know, my suggestion is, or my recommendation is with the way you guys are set up, you would benefit from this, this, and this. And this is, you know, something to think about from that IT perspective. But yeah, another I, thing. Sorry, let me just jump in. Uh, yep. I think what, what Josh is saying has really been true in my experience as an administrator is it, it's such a nuanced thing. Um, and and uh, Marie asked a follow-up question uh, that is, is there value in having IT support be local? That's a, that's a contextual question like what Josh is pointing out. One of the big factors is for those churches that do have on-premises equipment, do you already have someone that can service things in-house? If you do, then having that company be local is probably less of an issue. If you don't, then, um, then you probably do want a local, at least a local person who can do your uh, in-person tech support. And so that's probably the, the uh, de decisive factor in this. But um, we're bringing in Moonshot, just full disclosure, we're bringing in Moonshot to help us have a more flexible environment, not just from an IT standpoint so that we can get the support remotely, but also to allow our church staff to be more flexible in where they're working and what is going on with their individual work uh, station. And another thing to keep in mind as I was you know, talking through the slides is the monitoring. You, you wanna have whatever IT support that you guys have, you know, have that capability to monitor it, but you guys wanna have insight to it as well. So you want to set your monitoring and notifications up to, to where not only is, is that company that you have watching over it, in, you know, clued into everything that's going on, but somebody in, on site should always be getting those notifications as well, because we know we've seen, you know, our IT companies don't always respond, you know, when they, when necessary and things can get dropped. So if the more eyes we have onto it and the more you guys are, are aware of what's going on in your environment, the better off you're going to be. And all these products, whether it be Microsoft or Google or, or any of that, is they are customizable to where you can get those alerts sent out to multiple people, not just your, your IT company. So always keep an eye personally on what's going on in your environment as much as possible. That's great advice just to be able to kind of take a pulse check. We receive um, a, a report on a after patch Tuesday every week that kind of tells us uh, in a not very granular way what computers receive the patches and what doesn't. Uh, to be able to kind of take a daily look and just make sure that everything is going well on the Microsoft administrative platform, or if you're a Google user, uh, whatever that looks like on that side would be a huge step up. We do have another question uh, from St. Mark's Church. They want to talk about uh, the Microsoft 365 suite for Mac. They're on Exchange and found that it's great on the PC, but the Mac interface lacks. From that standpoint, I mean, you're you're always going to be lacking some features or the way things look from Windows to Mac. It's it's a Microsoft product. It's always going to de be developed first and foremost on the, the Windows machines, on, on Windows OS. 
I do have to say, though, in the last six months, they have made some great advancements with the Mac suite. Um, my my co you know my my counterpart here at Moonshot runs on Mac all the time. I'm the Windows guy. He's the Mac guy. Um, so he's constantly you know keeping up to date with what's going on the, on the Mac side, and he fills me in. He lets me know what's you know what features have come, what things have changed, and honestly, in the last six months, he has gotten really excited about what they've done to that that suite for the Mac from the O365 standpoint. Um, and yes, it, it hasn't been the greatest, I, I agree. Um, but honestly, they are getting better. They are uh, mi migrating more features over to that Mac side. So I don't know how long it's been since you guys have used it or if you're currently using it um, or if you've run the updates for the suite. You know, there, there's a lot of things. But is, is there any feature in particular that, that has disappointed from the Mac side? I, I uh, while we're waiting for St. Mark's to uh, reply to that, I can I can speak to that a little bit. When I first came to St. Andrews, my my dedicated computer was a Mac, and I found that Excel, a lot of the functions that I came to rely on were not just not there or didn't work as well in Mac. Um, and I I think a lot of uh, Mac users would probably relate to that to some extent. Um, one thing that I have known uh, to be the case with using uh, Microsoft products on different computers is uh, downloading different versions. Like I, for instance, use the 2016 version of OneNote just because I like some of the functionality that went away with the 365 version. Um, so you might want to play around with that. Um, you know, the version, the 365 versions are um, uh, optimized for web performance. So sometimes they've taken away functionality that is more of a dedicated computer issue. So um, St. Mark's might want to look at uh, downloading a different version of the software for Mac and see if that might work a little bit better. And you hit the nail on the head there, Zach, because even on the Windows side, the different versions are limited functionality. Like within Teams, you can you can manipulate and work on files, whether it be Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and all that, but it's limited because Teams offers the, the O365 version, the web version. So when you open it in the full uh, 2019, you know, office suite within your, your machine, you have all that functionality that you're used to. Um, so it, even from the Windows side, it's limited to that, that portion. Um, I see the the next question the outlook features the calendar in integration and then the views with the task pane um, you're always going to have a limit a limited view from calendar perspective and things of that nature because mac will only allow windows in so much to their native calendar their native os features things like that so it's never going to be fully integrated but um, i know on the iphone they have made some huge steps um, and again, over the last six months, they've done some more stuff with the calendar integration. Um, but to, to, to really dive into it, I'd have to have my counterpart come in and speak to what those are. We have about six minutes left. I want to highlight a couple of the things that, based on this conversation, this webinar, that we've implemented at St. Andrews or in the process of implementing so that the churches on this call can be thinking about how they look towards the future of their IT management. Um, and then I'll, at the very end, allow Tom to kind of plug how you can get in touch with uh, these wonderful uh, information resources and, and the webinar will, is recorded on the SEEP website, so you can check that out there. Um, really quick, we are transferring from a, a on-premises server to our files being on the cloud um, through SharePoint. And as part of that, we wanted to get our staff to use um, uh, Microsoft Teams, which to be honest, has been the most ignored piece of software probably on our computers at St. Andrews. And what we've discovered and through um, Moonshot, but also through the uh, diocese, um, Emily Davenport, the Bishop's assistant has uh, communicated with us how the, uh, how the diocese is using Teams for uh, collaboration uh, for people that are all over the place. So uh, that is one piece. We're moving the files to the cloud. We're using Teams to access them. But then kind of talking to Moonshot, we've realized that we can optimize our use of Teams to cover a lot more bases than what we were initially. So what does that look like? We're looking at replacing our voice over IP system with a Teams interface that allows people to accept and make phone calls on the church's behalf on the ch with the church's phone number directly from Teams. And, and we, we highlighted a little bit of that. Some of the other pieces that we're looking at is moving Active Directory to Azure 
and using some of those automation pieces so that we know what's going on with our computers, but also we're not reliant on uh, people being on campus to offer support or access files or do whatever the case may be. And as we've looked at this year, particularly 2020 has been a hard year to get people in the building. These things are things that uh, these solutions are things that we think will make us more flexible and responsive to the needs of the church. So those are just a few examples of what uh, interfacing with a company that is a Microsoft partner in this case, because that's what we're using. But you can look for a Google preferred partnership uh, if that's what you're using um, and and just talking to them about where can I find efficiencies? Where can I optimize our system? So I probably should have addressed some of those things at the beginning of this call, but um, uh, at least I've said it now. What other questions, what other, um, what other things do you think might uh, be worth sharing at this point? And I don't wanna to forget to allow Tom to share information about how we can get in touch with you. Okay, while, that, uh, while the questions are, are coming in, we can wrap up here. Uh, Zach, I wanted to thank you, Joe, and the entire SEEP organization for, uh, for, for allowing us to, to step in. We love the opportunity to help um, you know, whenever we can. And, you know, I, I especially appreciate the question that came in about how to find um, good resources. Um, you know, I had stressed um, the fact that these resources have to have the depth in there, but you'll know if the individual or the organization that you're communicating with is, uh, is what you're looking for, if you sense that they're educating you and they're helping you understand what's possible and what you have at your fingertips. Um, that's what we want. That's one of the most common um, uh, issues that, are, that new clients have when they come on board is that they just didn't feel like they were being fed. And when we start talking about all this stuff, they're, they're like, wait, what? I didn't know that what I have already does that. Why am I paying for this other stuff? And so just be mindful of, you know, if you get the feeling, if, if you get the sense that you're being um, educated by your partner, um, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. If they're local, that's even better. Um, but there's a good chance they're not going to be because so much of the time, the organizations that have this depth um, are going to focus on the enterprise level company. So if you can find that with a group that focuses on small to medium sized businesses, you found that you found the right place, the right home there. Um, I am always happy to answer any questions, follow up questions. You know, if there are individuals who may not have been comfortable asking the question during the session, you're always um, more than welcome to reach out to me directly. I think my contact information will be attached, um, but we're easy to find here at 321moonshot.com. Um, we're here to help. Love the opportunity. This is a great job that we have um, that we can make a lot of people's lives easier um, and help them save money for their organization as well. So Tom, more questions you. here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for those uh, closing thoughts. We'll kind of hang out, but uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning and thank you to our panelists. Uh, for bringing their wisdom and knowledge. Uh, Tom's point about sort of finding efficiencies in your organization and using what you already have is uh, that that has been the biggest uh, the biggest takeaway for me from this webinar. This webinar was recorded and will be available uh, with the presentation for viewing on the resources page at the seepnetwork.org. And if you have any additional ideas for learning seminars or uh, webinars or for the SEEP conference that's coming up, uh, please email those to info at seepnetwork.org. Thanks so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you, you SEEP organization.